If you've been following this series of videos from the beginning, you might be understandably frustrated at this point because you're like, we've invested all this energy into studying sets and topological properties of sets. You're like, when are we gonna to get to the good stuff? When are we gonna to get to calculus? When am I gonna to get to something that I can use to impress my cousin who's a junior in high school taking AP Calc this semester? And I promise we're getting there after just one more video. So in this last video, we're going to lay the final piece of topological brickwork in the edifice that's going to make calculus just fall out directly in the next few videos. And this last piece in the edifice is a study of how continuous functions, as we understand them, interact with topological properties of sets. In particular, when we're talking about topological properties, we want to talk about openness and closedness. So what are we going to look at? Well, supposing that I have a continuous function, and let's say I pick some set which belongs to the domain of this function, so some subset of the domain of f. I can look at the image of that set under my function and ask topological questions about those two things. For example, I can ask, if my original subset of the domain is an open set, then must it be the case that the image of that set is open? I can ask the same thing about any topological property. What about closeness? What about connectedness? What about compactness? What about nowhere denseness? What about perfectness? What about all of these things, right? We want to understand how continuous functions interact with those topological properties. And the main result of this video is the most important thing to know about how continuous functions and topology interact with one another, and that is, that if you give me a subset of the codomain of a function, which is an open subset, then the inverse image of that open set as a subset of the domain of this function is open. In other words, the result in this video is that the inverse images of open sets under a continuous function remain open sets. And this is going to be the topological result that powers everything else that we are going to come to learn about how continuous functions work and we're going to be able to get some immediate recognizable calculus theorems that fall directly out of this observation in just a couple more videos from now. So let's establish this fact to get us onto a nice firm foundation for what's coming. So if you haven't seen the previous video on the open set definition of continuity, you'll want to go back and review that uh, because that's going to be the way in which we're going to understand what it means for a function to be continuous in this video. And as you'll see, that understanding is going to make the theorem that we're about to establish come pretty quickly. So first of all, let's ask, should we expect openness of a set to be preserved in the forward direction by a continuous function? In other words, if you give me a subset of the domain of my function, which is open, will it necessarily be the case that the image of that set under my continuous function is still open? So just as an example, if we're using the regular topology on the real number line, let's say I take the open interval from two to six as my set A. That we can agree is an open set. And suppose that the graph of my continuous function looks like this. So it does something over here, and then maybe from x equals one to x equals eight, it's just sort of a horizontal line. And then it does something else after that. But the point is, if I look at the image of this set A, the open interval from two to six, under this continuous function, the image of that open set is going to consist only of a single point, a single real number f of a. It's a singleton set, right? because this function is effectively a constant function on the entirety of this subset of its domain. And so even though a is an open set, the image of a consists of a single point, and that's not an open set in the standard topology on the real numbers. Right? If I stand right here and I reach out my arms, no matter how short my arms are, I'm going to be touching something outside of this singleton set. So it's not necessarily the case that openness is preserved under the forward image of a continuous function. But here is our opportunity to remember how it is that we're understanding the definition of continuity. A couple of videos ago, we reframed the traditional epsilon delta definition that uses absolute values and inequalities and subtraction and arithmetic. We reframed it into a purely topological definition using sets. And it read like this f is a continuous function at a point x0. If for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that the inverse image of every epsilon ball around f of x will contain some delta ball around x. This was our uh, neighborhood, our open ball, our open neighborhood understanding of what the definition of continuity is. And so the fact that inverse image shows up in this definition is suggestive. It suggests to me 
that maybe we ought to assess the question of whether the inverse image of an open set under a continuous function is necessarily an open subset of the domain. So what would we be asking here? Well, if I have an open subset of the codomain of my function, which on a graph of a two variable function on the real line is, think of it as a y-axis, right? If I take some subset of the y-axis and I pick some point in that subset, it's gonna have an epsilon ball around it that's contained entirely within that subset. Because after all, that's what our understanding of what open set using uh, the standard topology uh, means. Right. So we're going to have an epsilon ball around my point that's entirely a subset of u. And according to my open set continuity definition, the inverse image of that epsilon ball, and that epsilon ball is contained entirely inside u, the inverse image of that will be some subset of the inverse image of u. But whatever subset that is, is going to necessarily contain some delta ball around the point x, which sort of belongs to the, the inverse image here. And so... What that seems to suggest to me is that because u, my subset of the codomain, contains epsilon balls around every one of its points, that's going to force the inverse image of u to contain some little delta ball around each one of its points as well. And we would therefore expect that the inverse image should be an open set. So let's state this and then write down a proof. The statement is that if f is a continuous function on domain E, and if u is a subset of the codomain, in other words, some subset of the real line, the y-axis, then if u is an open set, the inverse image, f inverse of u, will also be an open set. So what might a proof of this end up looking like? Well, it's that same argument that I made here informally. We're just going to make it into something that's formal and carefully cite our sources and show our receipts along the way. So we'll start by picking uh, an open set, arbitrary open set U. Right? And we want to conclude that the inverse image of U under F is an open set, remembering along the way that F is a continuous function. So how are we gonna do that? Well, the burden of proof to deduce that a set is open in the metric topology is to show that for any point that I pick in this set, we can find some radius, which I'm going to suggestively call delta here, such that the delta ball around that point is entirely contained in my set. Right, so here's my burden of proof. I need to show that for all x's that I pick in the inverse image of u, so all x's in this purple shaded set here, we can find some delta such that the delta ball around x is entirely a subset of my purple set, inverse image of u. So if this is the thing I'm trying to establish, the first thing I see is for all x in inverse image of u. And so in my proof, I'm going to pick arbitrarily an x in the inverse image of u. So if I pick that arbitrarily, then we're going to make a proof that's going to satisfy that existential claim. And in our open set definition of continuity, we've kind of made it to this point here inside the innermost parentheses, right? We know something about x. x is a point in the inverse image of u. Well, what does that mean? Well, the inverse image of a set consists of all of the points whose images belong to that set. So the inverse image of u consists of all the points in the domain of my function, such that f of those points is a member of u. So just by definition, x belonging to the inverse image of u means that f of x belongs to the set u. And that's just by definition of the inverse image of a set under a function, any old function. So now we've taken one step further out and we know something about f of x inside these parentheses. f of x is an element of u. So if I want to push a little bit further outside of my parentheses, I want to somehow get an epsilon ball into this mix. But how do I do that? I can do that by recognizing that what we have now in f of x is a point of the set u. And we know that u is an open set. So by our definition of open, that means that there exists an epsilon such that there is an epsilon ball, an epsilon neighborhood around the point f of x that's entirely contained within the set u. It means that if I stand at f of x, I can reach out my arms some epsilon distance. And when I reach out my arms some epsilon distance, I can only touch members of the set, in this case, u. So now I've taken one further step out, and now we know something about the epsilon ball around f of x. And according to what we're using in my playbook down here, that means the next thing I should try to do is look at the inverse image of that epsilon ball. So apply the inverse image under the function f to both sides of this set containment. If I do that, 
then I know, first of all, that the inverse image of the epsilon ball around f of x is going to be a subset of the inverse image of u. In other words, if I take all of the points that this guy can reach here in the, in the, uh, on the y-axis, and I look at those x's for which the image is one of those points, those x's are all going to reside within my inverse image of u. They're all going to be a part of my purple set down here that we originally started with and which we are trying to prove is an open set. But, and we haven't used this full definition yet, but now we can because we know something about the inverse image of the epsilon ball around the point f of x. Right? So now we have this whole right-hand side, and now that lets us apply this definition, the open set continuity definition. Because f is a continuous function, the inverse image of the epsilon ball around f of x as a subset of the domain of my function is going to contain as a subset some delta ball around the point x. So here's where we invoke the continuity. By continuity, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that the delta ball around x is a subset of the epsilon ball, sorry, the inverse image of the epsilon ball around f of x. But then, according to this line, the inverse image of that epsilon ball around f of x is entirely a subset of the inverse image of u. That's the set we're trying to prove is open. Therefore, we've shown that there exists a delta ball around x, which is entirely a subset of the inverse image of u, and so the inverse image of u is an open set. Let's just review this proof really quickly to make sure that you get the, the parts of the argument that we used here. We pick an open subset of the codomain of my continuous function. We would like to show that its inverse image under my function remains an open set of the domain. How do we do that? We pick an arbitrary point of that inverse image. We want to show that there exists a delta ball around that point, which is entirely contained within that set. To do that, we take that point, bring it up to the codomain, bring it up to the range, bring it up to the set u, and then invoke the openness of u to get an epsilon ball around u, and then invoke the continuity of the function to inverse image that epsilon ball down to a subset of my original set, which contains a delta ball inside it. And that delta ball is the one that we then use to show that this set was in fact an open set. So this is great news. This is the full story on how continuous functions interact with open sets. And because open sets are the foundation of every single topological principle that we could ever need to know in any topological space, this is going to tell us how continuous functions interact with every topological idea that we could ever come across. And just as a taste of that, we can remind ourselves that once I know something about open sets, I probably also know something about closed sets as well. After all, the closed sets in a topological space are just the complements of the open set. And so if u is open, that means that the complement of u is a closed set. And if we just apply this conclusion here, so the inverse image would be open, and so the complement of the inverse image would be a closed set. But, based on what we know about how functions and sets interact, the, the inverse image, the complement of the inverse image of a set under a function is the same thing as the inverse image of the complement. And so if I just look at this from beginning to end, if u complement is a closed set, then f inverse of u complement is a closed set. And just replacing u by u complement everywhere that we see it here, we'll be able to say, well, if u is closed, then the inverse image of u under a continuous function is closed. So continuous functions not only preserve openness in their inverse images, they also preserve closeness in their inverse images. So if you give me an open subset of the codomain of a continuous function, the inverse image of that set will be an open subset of the domain. And the same thing is true if you give me a closed subset of the codomain of a continuous function. The inverse image of that closed set will be a closed subset of the domain. So this is how continuous functions interact with openness and closeness. This is why continuity is a topological property. I want to wrap up this video just by saying that what we're seeing as a theorem here, as sort of a result that we had to do some work to prove, right, the inverse images of open sets are open, the reason that we had to do that work is because of where our definition of open set came from in the first place. Right? We were defining open sets in terms of a particular understanding of epsilon neighborhoods that are defined by a, a way of measuring distance between real numbers, namely the absolute value of the difference of two real numbers as a measurement of how far apart they are. Right? And because we had a specific notion of openness in mind that motivated our definition of open set, that's why we had to do some more work to sort of reframe our, our continuity definition in terms of this open set continuity definition and then use that definition to justify this statement. 
specified here that the inverse images of open sets are open. In fact, in the more general setting of point set topology, if we mean something else by open set, then this result is actually not a theorem. This result becomes a definition in point set topology. In more general point set topology, this is how we identify what it means for a function to be continuous. If we don't have epsilons and deltas that come from some way of measuring distances between points, in other words, a metric topology, if we don't have that, if we have some more general notion of topological space, then continuity means preserving openness under inverse image. As soon as you tell me what are the open sets in my topological space, which means specifying a topology, then I will tell you that a continuous function is anything for which the inverse image of one of those sets is also one of those kinds of sets. So whatever open means. If only the purple sets are open, then a continuous function will be one for which the inverse image of every purple set is a purple set. And so this is the sense in which it fits into the bigger picture of when we do topology. And in that, again, it's taken as a definition. Whereas here, because we understood openness in a very particular way, uh, we had to sort of discover this result as a theorem instead. But this result is going to be the linchpin on which the rest of our understanding of how continuous functions are going to make calculus work and make it possible fall directly out in the next few videos. So I hope you'll stick with me for those.